All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let's get started. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Tiffany Chen, and I'm a Director of Product Marketing here at Cuventus. We're here today to talk about the decision machine, how AI and behavioral science are transforming hospital operations. And we're really excited to have experts from the advisory board and Cuventus here today to discuss this topic. Now, before we dive in, uh, just a quick note about logistics. Um, you can submit questions throughout the webinar by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And we have time al um, allocated at the end of our presentation to answer some of your questions. We'll also be sharing a recording of the webinar afterwards. All right, so now that we have uh, the housekeeping items covered, let's dive in. So today we're joined by our presenters at Andrew Rubin and Dr. Peter Chris. So Andrew is a consultant with the advisory board's healthcare IT practice. His areas of focus are on artificial intelligence, consumer medical IT, biopsychosocial IT, digital health, and other emerging technologies. Previously, Andrew worked for IHS Market, where he was the primary analyst in charge of building out its health IT portfolio across custom and syndicated reports. Prior to that role, he was an analyst for IBIS World, where he covered indirect procurement research across healthcare and social services. Andrew was a frequent speaker at industry events, and he is also an active member of PINS. He received his bachelor's de degree from the University of California, Irvine, and his MBA from California State University, Long Beach. Peter Chris is the Director of Product, Analytics, uh, Product and Analytics at Cuventus, where he is responsible for the emergency department solution, as well as both analytics and behavioral science across all Cuventus products. Since completing his PhD in behavioral decision research at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University, Peter has applied behavioral and data science for organizations across industries, including healthcare, hotels, airlines, telecom, retail, software, energy, automotive, and financial services. In addition to academic journals, Peter's work can be found in the popular press, including The Guardian and Harvard Business Review. Now, Andrew and Peter will be discussing today how to apply artificial intelligence and behavioral science to transform hospital operations and patient flow. Uh, really quickly, before we uh, dive in, I want to introduce uh, Cuventus and the advisory board. For those of you who are not familiar with us, Cuventus is the first patient flow automation solution for healthcare. We take modern innovations in AI and machine learning, behavioral science, and data science and apply them to hospital oper operations. We're a proven partner with over 120 successful deployments at leading health systems, as you see here. And we deliver transformative results. So up to 0.8 day reductions in inpatient length of stay, over 15% decreases in ED length of stay, 23% lower PACU exit delays, and more. And we're here, uh, we're joined here by the advisory board. Uh, the advisory board is a best practice research firm that is focused entirely on the healthcare industry. For over 35 years, their teams of analysts and consultants have helped healthcare leaders stay ahead of evolving industry changes, and they assist their membership by developing content across a number of channels, including, including syndicated research, webinars, and providing access to content experts across roughly 18 healthcare verticals. So for this webinar, we'll begin with Andrew walking us through an overview of AI, what it is, its value proposition for healthcare, and key elements for successful AI transformation. Then Peter will dive into applying AI and behavioral science for patient flow and how Cuventus combines these to hardwire change and help partners deliver tangible outcomes. And uh, we'll be spending some time at the end answering questions from the audience. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Andrew to talk about AI and the decision machine. Thanks, Tiffany. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. As was noted in the intro, my role here is really to provide a summary of some of the research that Advisory Board has done in the healthcare AI space over the past couple of years. Now, there's lots of moving pieces, as you might expect, so I'll do my best over the next 20 minutes or so to kind of define the market, note some of the early work that we've seen, and some guidance around how 
hospitals and health systems can really start to leverage this technology. So let's start out with just some framing to outline this kind of broad spectrum of technology that feeds into this AI ecosystem. This visual representation you're seeing is purposely broad. We aren't trying to get too hung up on definitions here. So we think of AI as a concept of machines or computers or bots, whatever term you want to use, learning, adapting, and completing tasks like a human being. And that can incorporate any number of different applications like natural language processing or vision systems or robotics. And feeding into these intelligent and cognitive systems are a range of baseline techniques like statistics and advanced analytics, symbolic reasoning, or what we're calling bio-inspired systems, which we define as those techniques that simulate neurons, adapt to patterns of input, and layer into more sophisticated machine and deep learning systems. But another way of thinking about AI is shown in this kind of word equation at the bottom, in that the less that an expert or a user has to determine, say, the order of processing or the data to train a system, or any other steps to improve a model and its performance, the more that you could say a system would be described as intelligent. Now, AI falls into the sort of higher tiers of what we'd call advanced analytics. Now here, we're looking at a simple maturity spectrum for analytics, which is built on a foundation of raw data. Analytics is essentially about raising that data up to help inform some optimal decision. So when our industry starts to get into the practice of predicting the future or projecting patient risk, that's where AI really starts to shine beyond just kind of simpler descriptive or diagnostic analytic capabilities. Now, for years, the prescriptive analytic space was largely aspirational, but we've started to see that space open up in terms of some early AI applications. Though on the whole, adoption is still fairly low for many healthcare providers. So what type of goals do health organizations have that relate to AI? We're trying to use AI to solve many types of problems that can cover administrative, operational, financial, clinical, and research domains. The technology has so much potential that it's often the case that our members get kind of paralyzed in terms of where to start. And what's even more challenging is that many types of AI techniques from our ecosystem mapping can actually be applied to most and if not all of these different types of problems in some sort of combination. Matching problem types to AI techniques is a process that is influenced, of course, by your existing tools, skill sets, budgets, resources, and partnerships, which are going to vary from one organization to another. Oops, sorry, <laughs> moving this back here. Um, so matching problem types to AI techniques is, of course, a process that is influenced by your existing tools and budgets, like we just said, but it's going to vary depending on what industry you're in as well, right? Because, of course, in healthcare, we're dealing with human lives, which makes it fairly unique. And when it comes to achieving these goals in healthcare, AI does offer a few different value propositions, which we've grouped into three categories here. So first off, it excels in those tasks that are dull, right? Algorithms don't get bored, they don't get distracted, they're great for sort of taking over those repetitive review tasks, calling attention to the anomalies, and freeing up human decision makers to really focus on top of license decision making. And second, AI really looks more at detailed information. So taking broader and deeper data into consideration than a human decision maker can typically achieve in practice, often allowing it to even exceed human abilities and those sort of narrowly defined functions. And then finally, AI is really attractive for those, those tasks that are costly or hard to scale. So once AI is built, it can be pretty inexpensive to operate as it provides effective, unlimited capacity, 24 seven availability, and economics that really opens up a lot of new frontiers for business models and standards of care. Now, I've spent all this time so far painting a picture of positive potential for AI, but there is the reality, of course, that we've kind of heard this story before. The terms artificial intelligence and machine learning could be traced as, you know, as far back as the 1950s. And for decades, we saw lots of highs and lows in terms of AI hype matching its reality. But experts in the field have long believed that AI is fundamentally an exponential technology. So if you had the right combination of advances in different fields, 
we would see this kind of explosive growth, something similar to what we saw with the rise of smartphones or even the internet. And we feel like these days there are these three kind of primary inputs that are contributing to AI's recent rise. First is, of course, just the flood of digital data. Training AI algorithms requires tons of information, both from broad populations, but also having uh, it be deep in detail. And you could say that we've certainly made some big progress there. EMRs are now pervasive. Most professional interactions include some kind of digital component. We are using wearables more often. Progressive organizations are starting to also incorporate genomic screening or pharmacogenomic screening, for example. But then second, we also have matters of advancing our hardware. So faster and specialized processors, more inexpensive storage. Um, for example, if you have a cloud platform, you could rent 100 specialized servers for an hour when it's time to train a model and then deploy the finished model on much more modest resources once in production. And finally, of course, we have advances in the algorithms themselves. As AI has essentially come out of the lab and put into productive use, there's more automation, there's a better library, sort of off-the-shelf cookbook capabilities. So lots of advances, but how is it actually being put into action? Now on this slide, we're painting a range of different AI-enabled application domains, and we're separating, separating them out into two primary dimensions. So on the horizontal axis, we have a range of AI capabilities. On the left side, we're looking at more narrowly defined decisions and tasks. This is typically where AI excels today. Whereas on the right side of this graph, we have what we would call more general intelligence, right? This is intelligence that would be comparable to a human mind in its range of abilities and its readiness to adapt. Now on the vertical axis, we have higher risk clinical-based decisions at the top and typically lower risk, often administrative or operational decisions towards the bottom. Now we created this slide actually last year and we tried to estimate just a few placements of different applications, but this field has been evolving so rapidly that we often find ourselves needing to shift around a lot of these pieces. The main point being that that sort of boundary that you see there of what's possible today, it's expanding day by day. And some of the work that you'll see in Peter's section will highlight some more specific use cases around matters like patient flow, which can probably fall in line with that bottom right application there of what we call the self-driving hospital. Now, I noted how these days AI is still very much focused around kind of administrative or operational tasks, but with time, we will certainly see it increasingly take on more clinical-based decision-making. Now, if you take the example here of a typical primary care visit, you can imagine how a powerful technology like AI could start to substitute in for traditional human labor across a number of different steps from initial registration to collecting patient history, determining diagnoses and helping with documentation and assisting with matters like discharge and follow-up care. So applications aside, what does it really take to kind of get an AI solution built and up and running? We outlined some basic steps here across the following cycle. This is what we essentially labeled the decision machine. But before healthcare organizations dive into step one, this process really begins with explicitly calling out what outcomes you're trying to influence, what constitutes success, and a theory about how the benefits will be realized. And these planning steps are done with early participation by those frontline representatives of impacted processes. Then it's where we move to that first stage of AI development, which of course starts with acquiring high quality, well-governed data. In stage two, it's about training a predictive or prescriptive model that requires explicit decisions about the model's features and applying a lot of practical and ethical constraints to the model. And then once you have that proven model in hand, it's time to turn attention to the workflow stage of step three. And to be successful, most predictive models need to be embedded directly into the operational applications that users already work with. Processes may need to be amended or reinvented entirely to get the expected benefit, as we'll see on the next slide. And then finally, models have to be periodically reevaluated over time with some kind of human in the loop. Just altering workflows and introducing a predictive model changes systemic behavior, which may require various revisions to a model. Now, all of those four steps in that cycle that I just showed you are important, but 
for the purposes of today's webinar, I did want to call out step three just a little bit further when it comes to matters of workflow. And I thought I'd just do that by showing a simple example of how workflow can really make or break AI adoption. So we're going to focus a little bit here on Mayo. Now, Mayo Clinic has their breast care centers, which are actively engaged in clinical research and drug development collaborations. And they could have as many as 100 clinical trials running at any given time. The sheer number of trials and the constant churn of active projects made it difficult for their practicing clinicians to keep up and identify candidates for, uh, for trials. So Mayo decided to partner up with IBM Watson Health to develop a technology that would help to automatically match patients to those trials. The technology was launched in clinic early January of 2016, but they found that the initial adoption just tanked pretty much right off the bat. Clinicians felt like it disrupted the flow of encounters. They were essentially having to figure out how to match patients for trials as they approached the patient in the exam room. So usage of the technology fell to zero by the very next month. But Mayo, to their credit, decided to double down. They actually brought in some process engineers and they looked at the broader workflow. And in July of that year, they launched the exact same technology, but they had changes to the encounter flow to better incorporate the new technical capability. And it's a simple change, but it's a key change. With the new process, physicians would actually know whether a patient would identify as a match before they actually walked into the room which would give them some time to prepare for that kind of conversation. So beyond the sort of decision machine cycle that I've shown you, I also wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about, okay, what does successful transition to AI actually look like? Now, McKinsey defined some of those traits of those organizations that were actually able to have some early success with AI, which we're showcasing here. So for example, they found that on average, Larger organizations that had a history of early digital adoption were often more likely to be early adopters of AI. For these digitally mature organizations, AI is simply looked at as kind of just the next wave of digitization, and they had an advantage in terms of their scalability, whereas those organizations that have been slow to adopt digital technology tend to trail the pack in putting AI to use, thus kind of creating a little bit of a slippery slope for themselves. Early adopters are also typically not fixating on any one type of AI technology. They adopt multiple AI functions addressing a number of different use cases. Early adopters also tend to be motivated by the upside growth potential of AI instead of focusing solely on just cutting business costs. AI is not only about process automation for these organizations, but rather AI is a key driver of major product and service innovation. These early AI adopters also, key, had a strong support from their C-suite leaders, namely the CEO, which helps to really kind of sustain these initiatives um, as an organization-wide priority. Now, from an adoption standpoint, confidence and investment in AI remains fairly high. We're showing you some results from an Optum survey. This is of about 500 U.S. health industry leaders. Now, the Optum IQ survey reveals that there's been an increase in overall funding for AI-related projects from its previous survey. They also show that 50% of respondents expect to see a tangible cost savings in three years or less, and that's compared to 31% from their prior survey. And they also noted that implementation has also advanced, so 62% of respondents now report having implemented an AI strategy. That's up from just 33% in 2018. And they also noted that of those folks who responded that they do have that strategy in place, 22% of them report being at the late stages of implementation. Now, despite those positive metrics on AI adoption, we are still keeping tabs as a research firm on all of the challenges that we'll be facing along the way. If you think about it from the business side, one of the biggest concerns regarding the use of AI is, of course, just the reality that Healthcare requires this kind of high-level reasoning and contextual awareness when dealing with patients that AI still doesn't offer. And yet for simpler or more common tasks, there will be pushback about things like loss of human jobs to certain kind of low-level automation tasks. Cost is always going to be a concern, which includes, of course, developing, testing, certifying, and implementing, especially if there might not be in certain instances a very clear use case or ROI. 
AI also has to fit into workflow, as we noted earlier. So, for example, most EHR vendors didn't necessarily come out of the gate providing these robust integrated machine learning or NLP or other AI capabilities out of the box. And of course, there are so just so many competing priorities in health IT these days and with all these new facets of industry transformation going on, right? People are um, focused on population health management or precision medicine initiatives. And there's essentially lots of different angles to which people are trying to invest their, their dollars. Now, in that second column, there's a matter, of course, of legal and ethical concerns that we're trying to keep on top of as well. Technology is advancing far faster for, than regulation can really keep up with. AI developers really need to account for matters of fairness and trust in their systems. As we've seen, kind of biased training sets can lead to a biased algorithm that could be ineffectual or error prone. And of course, there is also the risk of medical malpractice claims and the liability that comes from AI systems missing a diagnosis or hurting a patient. And then finally, from experience, um, we know that not only um, do we have medical professionals who have to get used to trusting AI, but of course, the patients themselves also have to do this. We must ask ourselves to what extent are patients willing to trust their care to an algorithm? So having outlined those challenges, I figured I'd just kind of give, give some top line summary advice that we've offered to our members about how to prepare for AI. And first off, it's really about pushing them to include AI in their strategic planning scenarios today, um, rather than adopting that kind of wait and see approach. But remember, as we noted in the decision machine slide, before you invest in AI, health systems really need to have that kind of clear, concrete idea of how they're gonna use these tools to improve care quality or other business metrics. Key stakeholders should work together to really identify pain points and specific opportunities for improvement. You can't just go buy an AI product, dump a bunch of data in, press a button and walk away. And this doesn't have to be done on your own though. More providers we've seen have started to broaden out their partnerships with the likes of research centers or universities, and of course, collaboration with other healthcare systems and market vendors. Now, the second point here is about having access to, of course, the right experts in-house who could really kind of bridge that IT and business need to really truly leverage AI as well as ensuring that you enlist frontline staff and leadership for their active input along the way. Now, your executives probably don't have to know the intricate details of how an AI uh, a solution works, but they should take some time to develop an intuitive understanding of what AI is and the value that it can bring. And then finally, we recommend sort of taking off the blinders and noting how AI is being advanced in other industries beyond healthcare and pulling from those external examples to really see if there are lessons that can be learned in terms of how AI has affected, say, your staffing or workflow or cost structures. And even if you're not necessarily going to be an early AI pioneer, you should at the very least be aware of it and be ready to adapt as needed. Now, this slide here is really just further considerations for your takeaway as you folks will have access to this deck and recording. So, here, what we did was just kind of outline some questions for both your internal operations as a healthcare organization to prepare for AI, but also some questions you might ask as you start to kind of look into the market and deal with potential vendors or partners regarding their products and services. So kind of look at this as like a, a handy pocket guide for as you approach these things. Jumping into an agreement with a partner or vendor without any sort of thorough understanding of what they're offering would obviously be a, a, a risky move. So make sure that you are planning accordingly. So I'm coming to the end of my speech here. I thought I'd just quickly summarize what we talked about. So first off, we did note how AI can be leveraged to eliminate a lot of those routine, mundane, and resource intensive processes, but also free up personnel to be redeployed for kind of that higher value work. We noted how the rise of AI is likely not going to fade away. So best to start now before you get left behind. It is worth restating also that AI depends on a digital foundation that takes time to curate. There's no shortcuts for firms on their AI journey and delaying that transformation will only continue to give those early adopters competitive advantages. And while an algorithm's technical performance is certainly important, there's other matters to consider here like your data governance, organizational culture, and staff skills that are gonna be crucial um, as you focus on you know, using and implementing AI 
and really just focusing on those broader workflow and process changes as well. So that wraps up uh, the advisory board's perspective and kind of this crash course on the AI market. I'm gonna get now pass things off to my co-presenter, Peter, who is gonna do a deeper dive in some of the work that Qventus is doing in this space. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, for the excellent synthesis and overview of the space. Um, before I get into the AI and machine learning, um, I'd like to start with uh, the domains, that, some domains where we already have stronger intuition around how they move. Um, so one of those would be um, gas. So if gas gets cheaper, uh, what gets more valuable? So I'll give you a moment to think about it. Um, and one of, the, one of the first answers is cars. So the, um, you know, because they use it. So if it becomes cheaper to operate cars, they become more valuable. Similarly for roads, roads become more valuable as the cost to use them decreases. And then uh, so do um, airplanes to get more valuable as the cost to use them decreases. How about uh, TVs? If TVs get cheaper, what gets more valuable? Um, well, again, it's the complement to TVs. So for example, uh, video game systems become more valuable. Um, content, so uh, cable TV, streaming services. Uh, so the reason I bring these up is because I've been asked this question many times. Uh, what are artificial intelligence and machine learning? And the best answer that I've heard is also the simplest, which is that it's just predictions getting cheaper. And we know what happens when gas gets cheaper. We know what happens when, um, when TVs get cheaper. But what happens when prediction gets cheaper? predictions get cheaper? What gets more valuable? Um, <clears throat> one of the answers is the data itself. So the data is the raw material that empowers those predictions. So if that can be more efficiently transformed into useful information, then it itself is more valuable. So for the analogy here, the way we think about data science at Juventus, we're taking the raw ore, which is your data, and we now have much better ways of extracting the gold from it. That ore has increased in value. Um, that the main data source here is your EMR. The second thing that gets more valuable is human judgment. So one of the reasons is that um, choosing what to predict and how it fits into workflows becomes more critical. So people often intuitively think of uh, AI as, as potentially replacing human judgment, but actually what it does is it makes it more highly leveraged because knowing how to apply it then becomes a much more important decision. Um, secondly, the staff can now focus more on determining the best course of action instead of making predictions. So for example, like instead of spending time figuring out which barriers are likely going to get in the way of a patient's discharge, they can focus on resolving those barriers and the clinical decisions involved in that. Um, which is, a, is another way of saying that last point, which is the staff can spend more of their time making clinical decisions at the top of their license. So the way that intersects with Juventus is it's how we think about solution design. So our job is to hardwire hospital-wide flow best practices which in some cases is just making things that happen today much easier. But I think the more interesting are the cases where we can actually fundamentally change the workflow because of the technology. So if you're able to make better predictions and able to orchestrate, like, orchestrate action, you coordinate work across teams in ways that weren't previously possible, that can enable new workflows that actually are less work and have to achieve better outcomes. The third thing that gets more valuable when predictions get cheaper is the actions themselves. So if the predictions are better and the human judgment is more highly leveraged, the actions are more likely to be the right actions. And actions that are the right actions are higher value than those that are you know, hit or miss. So the way that inter intersects with Juventus is that it's how we think about behavioral science. So that last mile of how do you get the people on the ground to take the right actions at the right time, um, that's work that has to be deeply integrated with the technology. And we have the luxury of being able to leverage um, 30 plus years of behavioral science to, um, uh, to apply it in this domain in a way that creates sustained change. So I'll give a little bit more deep dive on the behavioral science side. Um, the, one of the key frameworks we take from the research is this idea of prompts, actions, rewards, and investments. Um, so I'll give an example of donating blood. So a prompt might be there's a blood drive you know, outside your work. Um, and that's what gets you to sign up. The action is actually going and donating the blood. Uh, the rewards are interesting. So, you know, often they uh, you know, give you a cookie <laughs> or uh, orange juice, um, but also emphasize like the social good you're doing. 
My favorite is these stickers, uh, favorite from a behavioral science perspective, because um, it's clearly not about the sticker, uh, it's about the signal. So you get to walk around the rest of the day and telling everybody that you're a good person without having to, uh, without having to say it out loud. Um, a particularly powerful reward in this case uh, that I heard recently, is a friend of mine who gave blood and then um, a few months later got a text message that his blood donation was just used. I found that really powerful. So those three are pretty, uh, um, prompt action reward are pretty intuitive. Um, the less intuitive one is investment. And what this means is uh, it's a piece of work that you ask the user or, the, or the, um, the person taking the action to do after they've gotten a reward. So in this case, um, I don't believe they actually did it, but what they should have done after giving my friend that reward was say, uh, hey, can you sign up for um, time to give blood again? And can you bring a friend? So that would be the investment that then feeds back into the system and creates a you know, snowball effect if it's, done, if it's, if it's executed. Um, now, like I said, we have the luxury of leveraging a lot of uh, you know, decades worth of research on behavior change, but virtually all of it is about individual behavior. How do you get one person to take one action? And even if it's in the context of a larger thing, like uh, social media would be a good example, um, the, you know, the behavioral science around um, behavior, uh, behavior change work has been very highly leveraged in, in social media, um, for better or for worse, but it's still fundamentally organized around one person taking one action. Because you know, one person you know, clicking one, one ad or one person sharing one photo has marginal value for them. What's different about our space is that one person taking one action is not enough. So the problem we face is how do you design these parries, prompt action rewards investments, how do you design them in a way that actually work? And then how do you link them together into, into organizational workflows that both meet the behavioral science requirements on an individual basis, but also achieve the organizational outcome? So I'll give an example, um, kind of a, a simple one of how we do that. Um, the, this is a case of how do you accelerate uh, discharges from the ED, you know, avoid potential discharge delays, free up rooms for other patients. So some EDs we work with have a case manager in the ED. Um, so this can start with a prediction. So for example, if we can tell from the data, uh, running a machine learning model in the background, that a disposition is expected soon uh, you know, for a particular patient, and say in this case, we, uh, if we we're expecting a disposition of discharge, for a patient that arrived via EMS, then there's some chance they'll need um, EMS transport home or back to a um, SNF. So in that case, we can just, when we generate the prediction, we send this notification, which is a chat thread uh, that we start. So that's the prompt. Uh, in this case, the prompt to the charge nurse, just needing to check, you know, is this true? The action is simply to confirm or deny uh, that. So they say, yes, um, transport is gonna be needed for this patient. That action for that user is the prompt for another user. So they're saying action is needed to facilitate transport. Uh, the case manager then takes that action. And then when it's completed and the patient leaves, the positive result can be a reward. I'm just saying, hey, this patient was successfully discharged, good job. Um, so from the ED charge nurse's perspective, this tiny bit of work, just clicking a yes button, achieved an outcome um, and because it was able to orchestrate uh, action of others. Um, we can then have the opportunity to, to give investment. So for example, just thanking somebody else would be one form of investment. Um, that investment from the charge nurse in this case is the reward for the case manager, who then uh, has another opportunity for, um, for investment. So in this case, some other way of making the system better would be asking, how do we improve the product? Um, what, what other information would be helpful to you? And they could say, next time, tell me mode of arrival. Um, so we don't need rewards every time, and we don't need investments every time, but in fact, there's some evidence, uh, good evidence, that uh, variable rewards, that is intermittent rewards, uh, can actually be more effective than consistent rewards. Um, but every workflow should get rewards sometime when the right actions are taken, similarly for investments. So linking these together is fundamental to how we think about um, how we achieve um, uh, outcomes in the hospitals we work with. Uh, one note here that I think is particularly important is around um, kind of the, the behavioral psychology of this. So I show this here. This is um, uh, the first time that a world chess champion um, was beaten by, uh, by a computer, Deep Blue. And the reason I show this is because um, 
of what they had Deep Blue do next. And after learning to play chess, they had Deep Blue predict medical diagnoses. So they built this tool where you input the symptoms, and then it spits back a list of uh, possible diagnoses in probability order. So they gave this to doctors, and the overwhelming response was, I hate this thing, it's useless. Uh, so the designers um, you know, uh, went back and made uh, one adjustment. And the first change they made was to change the phrasing from here's the probability of each diagnosis to here's the probability that this suggestion will be helpful to you. They give it back to doctors and the overwhelming response is, this is great. It's like having a conversation with a colleague. It's super helpful. Um, and so in this case, it's as subtle as a wording change, but it's really a much deeper point, which is that um, AI technology needs to fundamentally be assistive. Um, and how it does its work. And that's something that we take very seriously. Like the, um, the interventions that we, um, that we help build need to fundamentally make it easier for the people doing the work and help them focus on, um, on what they're best at and what they want to be doing, um, rather than uh, challenging their expertise um, or you know, having a big brother type uh, flavor to them. So this brings us to how we Think about combining the, um, the people process elements of this with the um, with software. Now, I think everybody in, in, in healthcare has had some experience with uh, consulting projects that um, you know, take a, a lot of upfront effort, deliver a uh, successfully deliver a short term outcome, but then you fast forward 16, 18 months, and you're pretty much back where you started. Um, some some of these people process only changes can be sustained, um, but through heroic ongoing effort. Um, and the opportunity we see with uh, integrating that with software is not that we think software can solve the problem alone by any means, uh, you know, it obviously cannot, uh, but what it does provide is the ability to have a pulse on all those processes over time um, and help um, manage the accountability on an ongoing basis. So you don't just fast forward 16 months and say like, oh, what happened? And where did we go wrong? Like on a daily, weekly basis, um, you can say, hey, this process isn't quite working as well. Let's re-engage. And that can be done both by the hospital leadership, uh, team leaders, uh, as well as um, uh, from key dentists when necessary. So we're able to um, change that people process and, in fact, new processes that, were no, that weren't possible before while actually sustaining them over time for, uh, for long-term impact. So there, here's just a, you know, a high-level landscape of the work that we do at Qventus. We work in the emergency department, inpatient, also uh, Periop and uh, Mission Control Center, which is a system-wide view. Um, so I'm just going to dive into two examples here to give you a flavor of uh, how this really works in practice. So I'll start on the emergency department side. And uh, one thing we do here is try to figure out how to make sure um, that we uh, are constantly um, facilitating the resolution of bottlenecks and avoiding crowding. And key to the way we think about this is this concept called bottleneck thinking. Um, which is, involves three key components. There's what we call flow vital signs, which are the symptoms of a process slowing down. So uh, a flow vital sign would be a process step that either is already or is predicted uh, to, to slow down. And so level zero would be overall length of stay. Uh, level one, in the case of the emergency department, would be door to dock, dock to dispo, and then the two most common exit pathways. But if you knew that Dr. Dispo was slowing down or at risk of slowing down, that's not enough to know what to do. You know, there's hundreds of possible reasons that could be the case. Um, so we go one layer deeper, which is breaking down Dr. Dispo into its component parts. So there's the physician eval of first order, there's the ancillary turnarounds, uh, there's the relevant results, so that is the results needed for a Dispo um, being back, so the Dispo decision actually being made. So in this example, like suppose you know that you find that uh, you know CT turnaround is a problem. Um, even that is actually not enough. You need to go one layer deeper, which is which component of CT turnaround is the issue. And once you've gotten to that granular level of, the, of you know, which flow vital sign is the issue, um, then it actually is enough to make the next step, which is identifying what resource is the fundamental constraint. So you can think of this as the diagnosis. Uh, so in the case of complete to resulted for CTs, that would be radiologist capacity. The only reason that CT reads would be slowing down is if uh, um, either the radiologists uh, have too big of a backlog or they're not working as quickly as they need to. Um, and that then has a relationship to the actions you can take. 
So we have this best practice set of action levers that are available uh, that will always need to be adapted to each specific site in terms of what resources they have available. Uh, sometimes there are regulations like, um, like not all sites can use hallway beds, for example. Um, so by the, what this, the way this um, way of thinking works is manages to embed the expertise of the best charge nurses into, into a tool that any charge nurse can use. So uh, what we know is that the best charge nurses hold a mental model like this in their head all the time, and they have to mentally keep a pulse on all these things that might go wrong, um, and then know what action to take when they do. And that's extraordinarily difficult. The number of possible things um, that have to be tracked, much less predicted, is just overwhelming for any single person. So our goal is to, to, to embed that into a tool, uh, to allow any charge nurse to, to manage flow like the best charge nurse in the world, you know, along the, moving in the direction of the self-driving hospital that Andrew was talking about. So here's the actual tool. Um, this is the first version of it uh, already deployed. Um, and the high level here shows you those level one vital signs, and in the case of ancillaries, level two. Um, so we can see like there's 12 patients in the door to dock steps. Uh, here are the door to dock predicted times, um, Dr. Dispo, and we see that the issue is in radiology turnaround. Uh, and so if we click that, we then see the deep dive on radiology, and we can tell that CTs is the problem. And when we hover over the, the issue, it then gives us those action levers. So that's, that's how we diagnose and find the, uh, the you know, appropriate actions. Um, but then actually orchestrating those actions is, uh, is you know, you're not going to have an outcome if you don't do that. So um, one thing we can do is generate the chat threads manually. So, in, so the user, like the ED charge nurse, can actually start the chat thread with the relevant people uh, who then respectively you know, get notifications on their, on their phones or other channels um, and then resolve the problem. But we don't want to have to have um, you know, somebody doing this clicking every time. So one step better um, is we just automatically, when we see a bottleneck, uh, automatically start that, start that chat thread just with the people who need to be involved to resolve it. So we're not waiting until there's crowding and then asking for a hospital-wide response um, all the time. Uh, we do that too. <laughs> it's a separate product. Um, but we want to, um, all the time, be taking these more targeted actions to, uh, to evolve uh, avoid the problem ever happening in the first place. So that's, the, um, that's an example in the emergency department, how we integrate the, the data science and behavioral science to, um, to achieve outcomes. I'll give a short um, uh, view into what we do in, in inpatient. So the, um, uh, one of the key areas here is how we um, uh, facilitate interdisciplinary rounds. So I think you know, many people have experience with interdisciplinary rounds done well and done not well. Um, but one of the problems is that it's so hard to get everybody who needs to be involved in the room at the same time. Um, it's just not feasible when we're talking about like all the ancillaries that might be involved, you know, uh, physical therapy, radiology, et cetera. Um, so the way this tool works is um, provides a, a board uh, where each patient is a row and the team has that huddle each morning so just run through each patient. It takes a minute or two per patient and say, you know, what are the potential barriers and what needs to happen next and make sure that everyone is on the same page. What's unique about it is that we can predict what barriers are likely to occur. So similar to the ED, where there's just an um, overwhelming number of possible things to consider, here um, we're able to, by predicting when the patient is likely to discharge, and then we can get confirmation or adjustment from the staff, um, that then enables us to look at the open orders or what orders are likely to be open based on patients of that type and then facilitate the right resolution. So, for example, if uh, this patient is likely to discharge in three days um, and is going to need a PT consult, well, if they're on Medicare, that PT consult needs to happen today or this patient isn't getting out on time. So that's the sort of thing that if it's missed, leads the patient to stay days longer in the hospital for no medical reason and it's more dangerous for the patient. Um, so what we do in that case is then uh, use that information to drive the workflows for the appropriate other teams who aren't even in the room. Um, so whether that's the updating the, the schedule for physical therapy um, or um, getting an MRI prioritized over others that maybe came in first or the orders came in first but aren't actually binding constraints for a patient, that's the way that we can, um, can improve overall length of stay um, across patients. And when you get all these pieces right, um, you can achieve, you know, very meaningful outcomes. 
Um, so if you get if you have the right data, um, that is primarily from the EMR, uh, we're able to make the right predictions, leverage human judgment appropriately, and get the right actions to be taken. Um, the outcomes can be dramatic, on the order of like you know half a day plus um, of length of stay across all inpatients, some hospitals we work with. Um, so this is really exciting to me because the um, the, the opportunities there, the pieces are there, um, and it's a it's a matter of it's a matter of the details, of course, and the execution. Um, which it's, uh, it's exciting to be in the middle of, and uh, I'm very optimistic about. All right. So I think I'll hand it over back to Tiff to uh, to facilitate the Q&A. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Andrew, as well, for walking us through how AI and behavioral science are really transforming hospital operations and patient flow. Now, at this time, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. And as a reminder, you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Um, so we have a few questions already, and then we can go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, the first question, um, what should be the role of the EMR or EHR in my hospital's AI journey? Um, for this one, uh, Peter, do you want to take that one first and then Andrew? Sure. Um, yeah, great question and a common question. Um, so the EMR is absolutely essential. Uh, obviously, every hospital we work with has one. Um, and EMRs are, are built for clinical data capture. Um, they're not designed for operations. So Qventus, I'll use that as a proxy for you know, AI applications generally, integrates with the EMR and then extends the value of the data already there. Um, so in our case, you know, EM, the EMR is the system of record. Juventus is the system of action. Um, and what that means is that we need to, um, you know, that requires both the real time and predictive analytics as well as the orchestration technology that fundamentally makes it easier for the people doing the work, which is something that you know, I've, I haven't heard said about an EMR before. Um, you know, the way that one of our executive customers put it is this is the first time that we've implemented a technology for the front line, not to the front line. Um, that's exactly how we see it. So the EMR is absolutely essential, um, and uh, I would say it's the I would, I would think of it as the clinical system of record, um, and uh, an orchestration and predictive technology uh, can be highly leveraged on top of it to magnify the value of what's there. Okay. Um, the next question: uh, How should we get buy-in amongst the users and drive adoption for incorporating AI into workflows? Um, for this one, um, Andrew, do you want to take this first? Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of dovetails a little bit off of what I just said, but there's essentially like two sides to this kind of buy-in perspective, right? You you essentially have, of course, your sort of top-down influence from from a governance perspective of your C-suite executives. So um, typically, the CIO is kind of our main, you know, historically has been kind of the one who oversees IT. Um, procurement and strategy and, and design and, and all that, but we've seen that sort of democratize across the C-suite these days where it's the likes of the CFO and the CSO um, and other kind of similar sort of non-IT executives that are really kind of starting to influence IT strategy and, and decision making. And so um, when it comes to real buy-in, there's kind of that influence of getting the IT and non-IT folks on the same page. And we've seen it and heard from our members over and over again that your CEO really needs to be on board with these things. Um, in, if, if only for the sake of really like sustaining AI initiatives over time, um, rather than this being like a flavor of the week sort of situation. So having that top line support is key, but from kind of a bottom up perspective, it's around really getting your kind of service line leaders, a clinician champion, or you know those people who are actually going to be the users of these systems, who are actually going to be affected by things that are implemented, um, getting them to really buy into this because they're the ones who, in the end, are really going to need to be um, leveraging this technology the most. And so we want to take their perspectives into account as well. Um, so so it's kind of a balance between that top down, bottom up approach. I completely agree, um, uh, especially on the leadership front. Um, and the one thing I would add is that you don't need to make this any harder on yourself than it already is. Um, and one way to do that is 
um, you know, along the lines of finding those champions, finding the specific teams, the specific units um, that are, are most willing um, to try something new. Um, and then if you can achieve outcomes with them, uh, you can leverage that to spread. Um, the last other point I would make is that um, uh, very important for getting that frontline buy-in is to actually have them involved uh, in co-designing uh, the process. Um, you know, as, you know, as you're thinking from Cuventa's perspective, like we obviously come in with some ideas around uh, what are the um, you know best way to do things in general. Um, but the devil's always in the details, and we never know that every they're all the relevant specifics of a given site, and we need the front line to design it well. So even if we could just uh, you know somehow get them to buy in without their co-design, it wouldn't be as effective. Um, and so it serves those dual purposes of actually uh, getting the design right as well as uh, getting the buy-in while you're at it. Got it. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Peter and Andrew. Um, all right. So I think those are the um, questions that uh, we've gotten so far. Of course, um, uh, if you do have questions after the webinar, you can reach out to uh, us at Cuventus as well as uh, Andrew uh, from the advisory board. Um, so that's um, that's the time we have. Um, you know, Peter and Andrew, uh, before we wrap, any uh, last remarks from from your sides? Sure. Yeah, um, um, oh, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, basically, uh, my one of my takeaways really is is granted everyone's kind of at a different point in their AI journey. I mean, you know, we we talk to very large multi-regional health systems and academic medical centers, but we also talk to kind of smaller um, rural-based community hospitals. And, and, that, and I think the idea is that for some folks, AI is still very much in this kind of realm of sci-fi. Um, and what we're trying to kind of get across is the idea that like, it's, it's very much happening already. Um, we, we've seen it implemented. We've seen results. Um, you know, it's not, and it's not always, you know, just the most uh, progressive or, or larger, largest health systems that are using it. And so, um, by all means, like, do not be complacent about this and, and just sort of, like, sit and wait to see how things are going to shake out. Like, we are actively pushing members to take AI um, as, a, as a serious opportunity um, to, to kind of maximize a lot of efficiencies and, and really the potential for what it can do on the clinical side once we really kind of get over some of those um, kind of initial barriers that we laid out. I mean, it's going to be pretty incredible what, what AI can offer. And so um, it is, it is a very real technology. It's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, that is similar. Um, I mean, I would just add how exciting it is to see this space evolve. Like in particular, uh, you know, I'd like to thank our partners that enable us to do this work. Like it's a privilege to collaborate with leading hospitals and health systems like um, Dignity, Fairview, Emory, Mercy, uh, New York Presbyterian. Um, and do things that really matter, like significantly reduce their length of stay, eliminate excess days, uh, ultimately increase the number of patients they can serve you know, while providing better patient care. So um, uh, I think there's, as Andrew alluded to, like there are some legitimate reasons for skepticism given the history of AI, but uh, um, uh, in many ways we're turning some really important corners and, um, and really um, achieving some great things. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew and Peter. Um, and again, um, if you do have any questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us. All right, thank you, thank you everyone, and uh, have a great rest of the day.